السلام عليكم ورحمة الله إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله I'll try to um, do this in less than 15 minutes, inshallah. Uh, the topic requires hours because when you're, when you're dealing with uh, aspects of Allah's names and attributes and aspects of Allah's uh, actions in the universe, it, it requires uh, depth and requires so many, so much contemplation and, and uh, reflection. But I will, inshallah, try to restrict this to uh, at least 50 minutes. Uh, <clears throat> the topic is, in, in, you know, in simple words, it's explaining the term Ya Ibadi and what comes after it. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, told us uh, when he said Ya Ibadi whether in the Quran or in the Hadith and I will choose a few verses of the Quran and I will choose one Hadith that is a very famous Hadith in, in that uh, topic uh, for me to make it closer to you so you'll understand the uh, connection between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a very very intimate connection because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is close to us. He's very near to us. It, it's only us or we that we don't realize it, oftentimes. Because of our, I, I we'll see why. And one of it is our distraction and our uh, shortcomings and our sins that separates us from that uh, intimate relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, but for me to actually explain it to you, I would like you to tell me who is the prophet or the messenger of Allah uh, Azza wa Jal and Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that was called uh, Khalilul, Khalilul Rahman or Khalilullah. Ibrahim? Yes. Prophet Ibrahim Alaihi Salam. Who else? Prophet Muhammad. Only two. Only two. Prophet Ibrahim Alaihi Salam and Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you know what, you know the term Millatu Ibrahim, right? Many of you are aware of the term Millatu Ibrahim, which is the way of Ibrahim Alaihi Salam. What Ibrahim Alaihi Salam did that qualified him to be Khalilullah, right? وَإِذْ ابْتَلَى إِبْرَاهِيمَ رَبُّهُ بِكَلِمَاتٍ فَأَتَمَّهُنْ قَالَ إِنِّي جَاعِلُكَ لِلنَّاسِ إِمَامًا That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested Ibrahim with so, so many different trials. And he completed all of them. And therefore Allah made him a leader, made him imam. And imam, which also meant that he also was the first prophet and messenger of Allah that was, that earned that closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is khulla? You know what khulla means, right? Khulla means that you are so, um, like, like that the, the love of Allah is so entrenched in his heart. It's, it's mixed with his heart, right? Al-Khilal, it's like something mixed. It's mixed, it's, it's in the depth of Ibrahim's heart. Right, so we want to know what Ibrahim السلام, from the beginning uh, used to say. In order for us to determine uh, what our relationship with Allah should be, we should also determine what Allah required or asked on the, like, told Ibrahim السلام, and other prophets to ask those people who worshipped other than Allah. You know, uh, so I, I will read to you this. In Surah Al-Shu'ara, Ibrahim السلام, asked his people, 
what to alayhim naba ibrahim tell them the news about ibrahim is qala li abihi wa qaumihi ma ta'budun is that he asked his uh, father and his uh, tribe what is it that you worship ta'budun what is it that you worship qalu na'budu asnaman fa nadhallu laha 'akifin they said we worship idols or worshipped statues and they used to make the statues themselves Ibrahim salam's father actually was one of the makers of the statues he says we worship them and we continue to worship them in, in awe and respect Akifin al like they are close to them al ukufu ala shay they continue to be with them they never give them up so Ibrahim is asking him because he saw that his father was the one who was making and he actually offered them food and they refused to eat. Didn't refuse, they didn't even acknowledge there is food, right? Right, so he said, um, he's asking, قَالَ هَلْ يَسْمَعُونَكُمْ إِذْ So this is a requirement. Can they hear you when you call upon them? أو ينفعونكم أو يضرون or benefit you or even harm you can they do that? No, none of that. That gives you an idea that a true God is when you call upon Him, He hears you, and He answers you. Why? A true God is one that benefits you and also able to cause harm. So, قال أفرأيتم ما تعبدون Do you see what you worship? you and your fathers and forefathers before you أنتم وأباؤكم الأقدمون فإنهم عدوون لي They are my enemy So right away that's ملة إبراهيم ملة إبراهيم عليه السلام is that you worship Allah alone and you shun away and denounce all other forms of worship to all other gods عدو enemies he told them فإنهم عدوون لي إلا رب العالمين except the creator of the of the worlds. Now Ibrahim is telling us his relationship with him, right? What did he say? Rabb al alamin, right? He is the Rabb. Alladhi khalaqani fahuwa yahdi. He is the one who created me and he will guide me, right? Walladhi huwa yutaimuni wa yasqin. He is the one who feeds me. He is the one who gives me water to drink. وَإِذَا مَرِضْتُ فَهُوَ يَشْفِيرُ And if I'm sick, he will cure me. Right? These are qualities of a God. Right? وَالَّذِي يُمِيتُنِي ثُمَّ يُحِينَ And he is the one who caused me to die, and then he will give me life. وَالَّذِي أَطْمَعُ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ لِي خَطِيئَةِ يَوْمَ الدِّينَ And he is the one that I, I really hope and... and, and uh, and eagerly ask Atma that he will forgive me on the day of judgment all of my sins. Oh my Lord, give me the, the wisdom, the guidance to be wise and the nubuwa, right? Hukum here also a nubuwa that you know that I'm connected to you in that way. And make me among those who are righteous. So Ibrahim alayhi salam set for us certain qualities of a God that we are connected to, right? Now, when you make dua to Allah, what do you say? No one, Rabbana, right? Rabbana, Rabbana. We always call him with the name Rabb, because he's the Rabb. He is the one who created us. He is the one who takes care of us. He is the one who looks after us. He is the one who cures us. He is the one who is in control of all of our affairs. Right? He is a Rabb. So what is the opposite of a Rabb? Is what? So if I am calling upon Allah, I say Rabbana. If Allah calls upon us, what does he say? Huh? Ya ibadi, right? You see where it came from? That is the connection. 
Allah, we call him Rabbana. He calls us Ya Ibadi. Right? Also, he says, Ya Ayyuhalladina Amanu, but it's different. O you who believe is different. O you who believe is in a context of giving you orders. But in here, Ya Ibadi is giving you guidance. He's giving you his love. When you say Rabbana, didn't you feel that love, right? For him. When you're when you're sick. Rabbana Shfi, Rabbana Shfina, right? Allahumma Rabbana Nas Adhibil Bash, Ishfi and Tashafi, right? You ask Allah for cure. Don't you feel that love? What is love? What is the most essential aspect of love, regardless of what kind of love it is? Can you, can, can you love someone and, and still be arrogant? No. The most essential element of love, Doc, can you hear me? The most essential element of love is that you're vulnerable. It is a vulnerable position to be loving someone, right? You feel vulnerable. You feel needing that someone. You feel that, right? For a reason, you, you want to express that love for that someone, and that expression is the ultimate vulnerability. That's why al-ibadah, he has, yani, منزله من منازل الحب right العبادة is one level of love and it's only a level that you can be with Allah not with any other then you become a mushrik if you love someone like you love Allah that's shirk right والذين آمنوا أشد حبا لله the believers are more in love with Allah than any of those people who love their gods. So this is where the meaning of Ya Ibadi comes in. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling upon us, calling us with something that is that re, that requires that we love him. That requires that we love him. It requires that. It's if you don't have that, you're not one of them. If you don't worship Allah out of love, you're not one of those. If you don't, that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ أُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Your Rabb, your Creator, said, call upon me, Pray to me, ask of me, and I shall answer you. Inna al-ladhina yastakbiruna an ibadati. Allah mentioned that if you don't do that, that if you are not able and you don't find it in yourself to call upon Allah, that means you have kibir. It requires for you to be able to be, al-ibadah is qudur, right? It is being vulnerable. It is being humble before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is Ya Ibadi. It's calling us with the purpose of our being. I have not created jinn and men except for the purpose that they worship me. So you understand why Ya Ibadi is a very beautiful way that Allah is calling us. In it is, is love. And that's why we need to know what's after it. When Allah says, Ya Ibadi, every time He says, Ya Ibadi, in the Quran, what is He telling us? So we can be like that, right? So we can earn that position of being you know, Ibadullah, right? That we have His love in our heart. It is important. One aspect of this, which is important, is that we feel al-faqr lillah, right? 
يا أيها الناس أنتم الفقراء إلى الله والله هو الغني Oh mankind, you are in need of Allah and Allah is in need of no one You are in need of Allah and Allah is in need of no one So that's why we are Ibadullah because if we are not Ibadullah, what, what are we going to be? What do you think you're going to be? Because ultimately everyone is abd. Every human being is abd. Everything that Allah created is abd. It submits to Allah, whether willingly or unwillingly. But would you rather submit to Allah willingly or unwillingly? Willingly, of course, right? Because unwillingly, you're not, you don't qualify to be among ibadullah. Willingly, you choose to love Allah. You choose to worship Allah. Which means that you have matched the nature that Allah created you upon. Right? The nature that Allah created you upon is what? Al-Ubudiyyah. That we serve Allah. That we serve Allah. So, Ya Ibadi is translated loosely into English as, O oh, my servants. O oh, my servants. So, let's go and, and mention some of the ayat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that. And then we'll go to the hadith. I hope that I will spend maybe two minutes with every ayah. <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, the first time you find the term Ya Ibadi, right? وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ نَا يَعْبَدِ عِبَادِي إِنْ جَنْرَوْ وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانَ فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُ لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ That if my servants ask you about me, he didn't say tell them to show you that he's so near to us that he doesn't need to tell the Prophet to tell us. He can tell us directly. فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ I am near. I shall answer the prayer of those who pray. I shall answer anyone who asks of me what they ask. أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانَ So when you pray, when you raise your hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, know that Allah hears you. Right? Like Ibrahim alayhi salam asked them, هَلْ يَسْمَعُونَكُمْ إِذْ تَدْعُونَ can they hear you when, they, when you call them? No. But can Allah hear us when we call him? Definitely. Yes. He hears us. Right? When he says, Let them answer me. Answer what? In this ayah, it is implied and understood that Allah is inviting us to make dua to him, to ask of him. It's an invitation that you ask Allah. Don't ask anyone else. That you don't have to go far. You don't have to go uh, far to your friend or anyone to ask for help. Raise your hands to the... Actually, it, it, the closest is that just... Uh, fall on your face and prostrate to Allah, sujood. The closest you are to Allah is when you are in sujood. Ask Allah. It's an invitation for you that he wants you to make dua to him. Well, you mean be? Definitely you believe in him, but also you need to believe that he is able to answer your dua. Yeah, you know that he will answer your dua. All you need to do is just ask. All you need to do is just ask, and he will answer your dua. لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ So that they will be guided. The second is قُلْ لِعِبَادِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا This is really important, brothers and sisters. This ayah is very important. Allah is telling the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, to tell us. قُلْ لِعِبَادِ Which means it became an order in two ways. An order from Allah and an order from the Prophet sallallahu Say to my servants who have believed. That's, an, that's one condition. They have to believe. Tell them that they 
should establish the prayer. وَيُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ سِرًّا وَعَلَانِيَةً And that they spend from what we have provided for them in secret and in public. Sometimes you have to spend in secret where nobody knows that you're giving charity and sometimes it's necessary to give charity in public so people can follow suit, right? سِرًّا وَعَلَانِيَةً مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يَأْتِي يَوْمٌ لَا بَيْعٌ فِيهِ وَلَا خِلَالٌ So these three things will protect you from the punishment of hellfire. And Allah is giving that advice to his servants. Out of his love, he's telling you, that's what you need to do to protect yourself from that day. What? Where you cannot have any way that you can ransom yourself. You can't ransom yourself. What are they? Prayer, charity, and believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have no shirk. That you don't have shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third one, inna ibadi laysa laka alayhim sultan illa man ittaba'aka min al -ghawin. Allah is uh, addressing Iblis that my servants, you have no control over them. You have no control over my servants. Why? They're protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What made them protect by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What made them protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Just go back to the first two verses that I mentioned. They seek Allah all the time. They ask Allah. They pray to Allah all the time. And they do the prayer. They do the charity. And they believe in Allah. Them being beloved by Allah protects them from the plot of the shaitan. It's important to realize that. He said there's an exception of those people who don't do this and follow the plot of the shaitan. إِلَّا مَنْ اتَّبَعَكَ مِنَ الْغَاوِينَ Those who forgot their purpose. Forgot their purpose in life. What is your purpose in life, Doc? To worship Allah, right? If you forgot that purpose. I'm sorry I keep calling you Doc. It's fine. You deserve that. You deserve it. It's to worship Allah. So if you forgot that purpose, you became confused, you became misguided, and taghawi, so you will be following the shaitan. So those the shaitan will have um, control over sometimes. Now this is the next one. قُلْ لِعِبَادِي وَقُلْ لِعِبَادِي يَقُولُ الَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنْ إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ يَنْزَغُ بَيْنَهُمْ إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ كَانَ لِلْإِنسَانِ عَدُوًّا مُبِينًا this is a very good advice from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, sometimes these servants of Allah, we, we make mistakes, right? We do make mistakes. And sometimes we hurt each other with the words that we use. So Allah is telling us, in order for you to protect you and your fellow uh, Muslims and fellow believers from the plot of the shaitan is... Try to choose your words. That Ibadullah have a different choice of words that they say. And they think before they say it. Say to my servants to say what is best. For any situation, you have two choices or three choices, right? Let's say two choices. To say this word or that word? You have two words. So which one would you choose? Two statements. Which one would you choose? You would choose the statement that will not open the gate for the shaitan to come in. Right? Because Allah says, Inna shaytana yanzahu baynahum. Indeed, if I, if I provoke you, Umair, you will have the thought to answer me back and talk back to me and choose not appropriate words, for example, right? Because I provoked you, right? Why would I do that? Why should I do that? Right? So this opens the gate for the shaitan between me and you. So it's important when you are in a situation that you interact with your brothers and sisters, with your fellow community members, with your colleagues, with co-workers, with anybody, 
that you bite your tongue first. You word, you own your word as long as it's still inside your mouth. Once it comes out, she owns you. Your word will own you, right? So choose what is best. And Allah gives us, gave us this advice. And this is important in all relationships, in marriage, in friendship, in work, any relationship. You could say something that you could lose your job because of what you say. Or you could say something that you could lose your marriage because of what you say. So why? Because the shaitan will come in after certain words are being said. So Allah is advising the believers with that. Now the, second, the third one, يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِنَّ أَرْضِيَ وَاسِعَةٌ فَإِيَّايَ فَعْبُدُونَ Allah is telling us, our purpose is to worship Him. So if you cannot worship Allah in this place, move. Go somewhere else and worship Allah because that's what your purpose is. Your purpose is not to be in a place. Your purpose is to be able to worship Allah in a place. If that place is not conducive for you worshiping Allah, you leave that place. Same thing. If you have a job that's not allowing you to pray and makes it difficult for you to pray, leave that job and Allah will provide. Allah will make ways. Of course, that's after you negotiate, you go through whatever process that you need to go through, ask Allah to help them, ask Allah to guide them. But eventually, if it becomes where it's a deadlock, no. You have to choose between the dunya and the akhirah. To worship Allah or not worship Allah. So which one do you choose? That's why Allah says, Inna ardi wasi'a. My land is vast. Wherever you go, let that be your purpose in life, is that worship Allah first, right? So this is, these, are advice, these are pieces of advice that Allah and, and guidance that Allah gives to those whom he loves. So now let's go move to the hadith, which is a very important hadith uh, narrated by Abu Dhar al-Ghafari radiallahu anhu. عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فيما يرويه عن ربه عز وجل أنه قال. So this hadith narrated by Abu Dhar from the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم in which the Prophet said Allah says which means this is a hadith Qudsi. The hadith Qudsi is also words of Allah. Allah said this hadith but it's not like the Quran. It's different from the Quran. It's hadith that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said Allah said. Right? That's how you recognize it. But it is also words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What did he say? Ya ibadi, O my servants, inni harramtu dhulma ala nafsi, waja'altuhu baynakum muharraman, fala tazalam. I have made injustice forbidden upon myself, and I made it forbidden upon you. So do not wrong one another. Do not do injustice to one another. Do not oppress one another. Oppression is, is really uh, despised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah does not guide those who are zalimun. Wallahu la yahdil al-zalimin. Allah does not guide those who are zalimun. That's why Allah started this hadith with tahrim al-zulm. Prohibition of oppression of all kinds. And one of and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it forbidden upon himself, even though he is able over everything. He can do anything. Allah is able to cause injustice, but he will not. He's telling you that's an assurance to you that Allah will never cause injustice. And that is to show the prohibition of injustice and to show the perfection of Allah's justice. To show the perfection of Allah's justice that he made it forbidden, he made injustice forbidden upon himself. Not because he's incapable of doing it. Not because he's unable to be unjust. So this is 
important to realize. Inna Allah la yadlimu misqala dharra. Allah will never do injustice even an, a, a weight of an atom will never do injustice. And Allah does not oppress. Um, Allah made it forbidden upon us. And Allah also promised that anyone who is exposed to injustice, that Allah will give him support. He will always be supporting the people who are mazloom. When the Prophet, when the Prophet ﷺ, uh, spoke to Mu'ad bin Jabal radiallahu anhu, as he went to Yemen, he spoke to him about, you're coming to a people of the book, the first thing that they will ask you, the first thing that you will, should invite them to is al-wahdaniya, the, the oneness of Allah. And he continued to give him advice because he was going to Yemen where, to become the emir in Yemen and representing the Prophet ﷺ there. And he ended it with, وَاتَّقِ دَعْوَةَ الْمَظْلُومِ فَإِنَّهُ لَيْسَ بَيْنَهَا وَبَيْنَ اللَّهِ حِجَابِ And beware and protect yourself from the prayer of the oppressed, that they make dua against you, because there is no barrier between it and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even doing injustice to non-believers is forbidden. Even doing injustice to non-believers is forbidden, because... Allah will give victory to those who are oppressed. He will support them by virtue of being oppressed, even if they're not believers. Even if the oppressor is a believer. Because da'wat al-madhum is answered, regardless of who that madhum is, who that oppressed is, whether he believes in Allah or not. If he makes dua to Allah to uh, support him and protect him from oppression, Allah will do so. So then, that being said, now Allah tells us another thing. He repeats Ya Ibadi ten times in this hadith. He repeats the term, O oh, my servants, ten times. The second one he says, Ya Ibadi. So, Ibadullah do not cause injustice. Do not oppress. And if they do, they seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they give back uh, the right of the people to the people. That is Ibadullah. And if they don't, and if they insist on injustice, they will not be called Ibadullah anymore. They will not be qualified. The second one, Allah says, Ya ibadi kullukum dalun illa man hadaytu fastahduni ahdikum. Oh my servants, all of you are astray except those whom I guided, except those whom I have guided. So ask guidance of me and I shall guide you. And this is so important to Ibadillah, to the people who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and have that connection with Allah, is that they seek guidance of Allah all the time. They seek guidance from Allah all the time. And... Um, Allah made it where we say it in the prayer over 17 times a day. Ihdina sirat al mustaqim. Guide us to the straight path in our prayer. So, how does someone who's guided ask Allah for guidance? When you say ihdina sirat al mustaqim, does it mean that? Every time you ask Allah to guide you to the straight path that you are not guided? No, it doesn't mean that. It means three things. It means that increase us in guidance. When you say, Ihdina sirat al mustaqim, every time you say it, you're asking Allah to increase you in guidance, in hidayah. To keep you firm on the path. Ihdina sirat al mustaqim means keep us firm on the path. Also, ihdina sirat al mustaqim keep us guidance in the future because we don't know what happens to us in the future. No one can guarantee that they will continue to be guided. Many people went astray and were not guided. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us all the time. And that was the Prophet sallallahu The Prophet sallallahu used to ask Allah for guidance all the time. In... in we know that uh, 
in the night prayer, the Prophet ﷺ would say, Allahumma rabba Jibra'ila wa Mika'ila wa Israfeel, Fatir al-Samawati wal-Ard, Alim al-Ghaybi wa shahada Anta tahkumu bayna ibadika fi ma kanu fihi yakhtalifun, Fahdini li makhtulifa fihi min al-Haqqi bi-idhnik, Innaka ma tahdi man tashaw ila sirat al-Mustaqim. The Prophet used to make that dua, asking Allah, Every night, whenever he started the prayer, he's asking Allah to guide him to the truth of all matters. To guide him to the truth of all matters. Guidance is important. And as you see from the prayer of Ibrahim, السلام, he says, He created me and he will guide me. And guidance is guidance of meaning knowledge. And guidance also meaning that you will be blessed with guidance until the day you go to Jannah. Meaning the guidance of success. Because a lot of people have guidance. You read a book, you're being guided. You can go and give da'wah, right? Those who give da'wah, you give guidance. But can you guarantee that you give success? Can you guarantee that these people will be guided until they reach Jannah? No, that is only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So guidance of the mind and guidance of the heart. Who has the guidance of the mind? Anyone can have that. You can teach anyone and guide their mind to the truth and teach them Islam. But guidance of the heart is only with Allah. Right? That's why you find hypocrites. Al-Munafiqoon, many of them have knowledge, right? They have knowledge, but they are not guided. Their heart is not guided. Iblis, Iblis is knowledgeable. He has all the knowledge, but he's not guided. His heart is not guided to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what we ask is that Allah guides our heart to be firm in the straight path and that we follow um, the way of Ibadullah. So what is the next one? He says, and this is really a beautiful one. <clears throat> يَا عِبَادِي كُلُّكُمْ جَائِعٌ إِلَّا مَنْ أَطْعَمْتُهُ فَاسْتَطْعِمُونِي أُطْعِمْكُمْ O my servants, every one of you is hungry and in need of sustenance. Right? Except those that I sustain. Except those that I feed. So ask of me and I shall give you. And I shall feed you. And you know in Surah Al-Waqi'ah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that uh, we could sow the seed, but can we guarantee that it will be planted? Can we guarantee that it will grow? Can we guarantee, even if it grows, that it will have fruits? We can't. Who can guarantee that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where do we get all of our food? From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to put an effort that's true, but that doesn't mean that your effort will give you the ultimate result, which is to feed you and feed your family. So Allah is the one who does that. And that, uh, that was one of the blessings of Jannah when, uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned that to Adam when he put him in Jannah. What did he say? إِنَّ لَكَ أَلَّا تَجُوعَ فِيهَا وَلَا تَعْرَى That is guaranteed for you that you will never be hungry in it and you will never be naked. And both of these two things are sources of humiliation for mankind. You see, if, if part, of, of, uh, part of fasting is to, f to make you feel humble, right? Because you get hungry. When you're hungry, you're humble. And when you're naked, you're humiliated, right? But Allah guaranteed that for you. He said, that you ask me of food and I will feed you. كُلُّكُمْ عَارٍ إِلَّا مَنْ كَسَوْتُ فَاسْتَكْسُونِي أَكْسُكُمْ Every one of you is naked. We were born naked. We came out to this life is like what? Naked. Right? But then we're clothed. Allah sent us the blessing of clothing. And then we'll leave this earth naked. And when we are resurrected, we are resurrected naked. All of us are 
vulnerable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of us are in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for our basic needs, our the, the most basic needs, like food and clothes. And we're enjoying that now because it's a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we should always thank Allah for this and always ask Allah for it, whether it's food or clothes, cover, that we cover our shame, that we cover our vulnerability, because that is the epitome of ibadah, is that we're vulnerable to Allah. Antum al Allah. You are in need of Allah. Wallahu huwa al-ghani, and he's not in need of you. Then it continues to say, Ya ibadi, innakum lan tablughu dharri fatadurruni. Before that, I think this is, he said, innakum tukhti'una bil layli wal nahar, wa ana aghfiru al-dhunuba jami'a, fastaghfiruni aghfir lakum. So now, you see, it's, let me take you to a scene where you become a parent, right? And you know that your son sometimes smokes and, you know, does things hiding. And, uh, and you go to your son, he says, son, I know what you're doing. I know what you're doing. You can't really hide from me, right? All you need to do is just tell me and I will help you. And I forgive you. Right? Imagine this conversation that Allah is telling us. That he's telling you that he knows what you're doing. He knows what you're doing. He says, إِنَّكُمْ تُخْطِئُونَ فِي اللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ I know you, you sin in the day and in the night. وَأَنَا أَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا And I forgive all sins. فَاسْتَغْفِرُونِي أَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ I mean, this is an amazing statement, if you think about it. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the greatest, our Rabb is calling us. You know how we call Rabbana? He's calling us, Ya Ibadi. Oh, my servants, I know that you make mistakes. I know that you sin in the day and in the night. You should know that I forgive all sins. All you need to do is seek forgiveness of me and I shall forgive you. Now, if you don't ask Allah for forgiveness after hearing this, I don't know what's wrong with you. Really, if, if none of you said Astaghfirullah now, I think you should before I say, what's wrong with you? Astaghfirullah, Allah knows what you're doing. So this is beautiful. And why it's beautiful? You don't have to be perfect to be Abd Lillah Azzawajal. You don't have to be perfect. Allah did not create a perfect person. Allah's creation is perfect by all means. But Allah did not create you to be perfect in your actions. He didn't. He knows that you will sin. He actually said, if you don't sin and ask forgiveness of me, I will replace you with people who will make mistakes, who will sin and ask forgiveness of me, and I will forgive them. This is important for us because sometimes the shaitan will come to you after you have sinned, after he actually misguided you and caused you to sin, and he will say, Allah will never forgive you. You did something horrible. You did something horrible. I can't see Allah forgiving you. Remember the story of the 99, the person who killed 99 people, this serial killer, right? He was looking, f he, he felt that he needed forgiveness, right? He needed forgiveness like everyone else does. And he said, please, I, I need to be forgiven. I'm, he's in turmoil. Find me someone that can lead me to a way, teach me how to seek forgiveness, and they told him, oh, there's someone who prays all the time. He's in that mountain or in that cave. He goes there. He says, this is what I do. He says, get away from me. I don't want your curse here. You're cursed. Leave. No. You have no hope. You have no hope in forgiveness. So what he does, he kills him. Now, how many? 
he has on his rap sheet? A hundred, a hundred murders. But he still wanted to forgiveness. They tell him there is a person that can teach you. He goes to that person, a man of knowledge, and he tells them, Allah's forgiveness is vast. Allah's gates of repentance will not close. Yes, you have a chance, but you need to change. You need to change your, your way. You can't continue to do that. You need to stop and then go to this village where people don't know you and start over. There are people there that can help you. He goes, and it just so happened that his life ends right there, and the two angels, two sets of angels come, and they want to have his soul, angels of hellfire and angels of Jannah. The angels of hellfire said, well, he killed a hundred people, never even prayed. The other ones, they said, well, he repented to Allah, and he was on his way to change his life. And Allah will send another angel to judge between them. And they measured the, the, the distance and they found that he was closer to the people of Jannah. And which means an indication that he's ours. He's one of the people of Jannah. So what I'm trying to say here is there's no sin that is greater than Allah's mercy and, and forgiveness. Even shirk. If you ask Allah to forgive you, if you ask Allah to, if you repent to Allah from shirk, Allah will forgive it for you. That is if you repent. But Allah promised not to forgive shirk for those who don't ask and change their life and convert to become believers. So this is important to realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to seek his forgiveness. And he knows that we are not perfect. He knows that we make mistakes. He knows that we're weak. He knows we're weak. You know, Imam al-Shafi'i said, walk to Allah broken and weak. Don't wait until you become able and perfect. Don't wait. Walk to Allah. Even if, you, even if you're limping, even if you're crawling, walk to Allah. Even if you think that you don't deserve Jannah. Who told you that? Even if you think that you, you're not worthy of Allah's mercy. Who told you that? Right? Walk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah knows what you're doing. Allah knows your heart. And he may change it. And you become one of ibadillah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So... You don't have to be perfect to be one of the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he continues to say, Ya ibadi, innakum lan tablughu dharri fatadurruni, wa lan tablughu naf'i fatanfa'uni. Oh my servants, you will never be able to reach the level where you can harm me. So you're not going to harm Allah with your sins. Your sins do not affect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It affects you. These sins affect you if you don't forgive, if you don't ask Allah for forgiveness. Your good deeds do not affect Allah. They don't benefit Allah. Your prayers don't benefit Allah. Allah doesn't benefit anything from you. Don't think that you're doing Allah a favor because you're Muslim. Don't think that you're doing Allah a favor because you come to the masjid and pray. You know, we have, you know, there are people who are like self-righteous. They think that, oh, they reach a level where no one can, you know, they, they could never be uh, misguided ever. And they will always be uh, believers. And they're better than everyone else. And they look down at others. This will not benefit you. What benefits you is your humbleness before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that you realize that you need to worship Allah. Not because Allah needs it. It fulfills something in you in this life and it saves you in the hereafter. You will never be able to benefit Allah or reach a level where you can harm him. So this is important when you commit a sin that that sin only hurts you, will not hurt Allah. So you ask Allah to forgive it. And that sin can hurt you in different ways. And the consequence of the sin, right? 
And that's why you ask Allah to forgive you and that he forgives the consequence of the sin. Because every sin, not just it's a sin, it brings about results that are not good for you. And the faster you ask Allah to forgive you, the better for you. Because Allah will then uh, protect you from all these results, all the effects of, of these sins. Then he continues to say, يا عبادي لو أن أولكم وآخركم وإنسكم وجنكم كانوا على أتقى قلب رجل واحد منكم ما زاد ذلك في ملك شيء and that if the first of you, the last of you, the ends of you, the gen of you came and became all righteous you became all like Abu Bakr every one of you is like Abu Bakr will never increase anything in Allah's uh, kingdom doesn't benefit him لو أن أولكم وآخركم وإنسكم وجنكم كانوا على أفجر رجل واحد منكم ما نقص ذلك من ملك شيء. That if the first of you, the last of you, the end of you, the ends of you were all like Abu Jahl, they're all like Fir'aun, will not really uh, decrease anything from Allah's kingdom. It doesn't really hurt him. It doesn't benefit him. Then he says, لو أن أولكم وآخركم وإنسكم وجنكم قاموا على صعيد واحد فسألوني فأعطيت كل واحد منكم مسألته ما نقص ذلك من ملكي إلا كما ينقص المخيط إذا غمس في البحر. That if the first of you, the gen of the last of you, the gen of you, the ends of you, all of them, all of you came together and asked of me for anything and I gave every one of you their demand that it will not decrease from my kingdom anything except as if you put a needle in the ocean and bring it out what kind of water would it decrease from the volume the water volume of the ocean insignificant so it shows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to answer all of your prayers, is able to give you everything you want. But is that, does that really, is that what you really want in this dunya? No. Because sometimes we ask for things in which we have our detriment, our harm. And it's for our benefit that Allah will replace that for us with a good thing in the hereafter or remove an evil thing from our life and then Allah says and concludes this hadith with Ya ibadi O my servants innama hiya a'malukum uhsiha lakum thumma uwafikum iyaha faman wajada khayran falyahmadillah وَمَنْ وَجَدَ غَيْرَ ذَلِكَ فَلَا يَلُومَنَّ إِلَّا نَفْسَهِ O my servants, it is but your deeds that I reward you or punish you for. And they recompense you for it. So let him who finds good praise Allah. And let him who finds other than that blame no one but himself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised us that he will never do injustice. And that he actually treats us with mercy. And he gave us these, this guidance so we can continue to be special people in his eyes. Not like any other. People that deserve the term ibadillah. Which means that we should really be connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By watching what we do. By watching what we behave and how we behave, and what we believe, and how we seek Him all the time. And by being humble, if, 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 if I want to say that one aspect of a believer that is really highlighted here, it, there are two, humbleness and need. That we're humble to, before Allah, and we need Him. We need Him. And if you think that you don't need him because you are able to you know, cut through life, Allah will leave you to your devices. 
to your own devices and let you fend for yourself and see what you do. And you need to be different from other people who don't worship Allah, don't believe in Allah, and how their life is. The difference is vast and big. At least, and this is really important in our heart, at least when, when we are afflicted with something, that we don't lose hope. We know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there, and He's close to us, and we can always call upon Him. You can always wake up before Fajr and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, you know, lay your problems right before him and say, oh Allah, this, this is what I have. And have a conversation with him. Uh, truly, use your own language if you want to. Use your own language. Allah knows your problem, but it's good to verbalize that for you. To know, okay, I, I, you could say, I explained my situation to Allah. Allah knows your situation even before you speak a word. And just cry before him and ask him. And just lay it all there. Open your heart to him because your soul needs him. Your soul needs him. And he calls you, Ya Ibadi, for a reason. Just we call him Rabbana for a reason. Because he's a Rabb. He can think, he can change everything for you. He can change everything for you. But at his time, on his time, not on our time. You can't be hasty. You can't say, I asked and I never got an answer. No. Right? That you can't just say that. What I wanted to actually for you to realize is that. I chose this topic because I want people to know who Allah is and what He does for us without you knowing it. It's just you need to know that this Creator of yours has been watching over you and loves you. And you need to come forward and be the one that deserves his kindness and deserves his love and deserves his compassion and deserves that he calls you Abdi, right? That he calls you my servant because there is nothing better than being Allah's servant for us as human beings. I want you to develop that relationship with him. If I just can do that, I need it myself. And believe me, I find Everything that happens to me every day is a way for me to connect with him. If it is something bad, I ask for his help. And I ask for his help eagerly. I be eager with him. Be forceful sometimes. Allah wants you to be firm and, and sure, not to be wishy-washy. When you ask, be firm and ask with, with power. Demand if you want and if you will. Um, and if it is something good, it's an opportunity for me to see the goodness of Allah, the kindness of Allah, and thank Him for it. And that's the, the status of, of the believer. I ask Allah that we all become like that. And believe me, if you're humble and vulnerable before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is better for you. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned those who are not. He says, Kalla inna al insana la yatgha an ra'ahu stagna. Nay, indeed, mankind go and overstep their boundaries. They transgress when they become rich, when they think that they don't need anyone. When they, when they think that they are insufficient, but they don't know. They don't know that this can, can change in, in a matter of a second with a, with a stroke. How many people who were like strong and everything and then they had a stroke. Then they are completely uh, incapacitated, cannot even move. 
That is if they don't die, or that is if they don't lose everything and become and, and get into a coma. And, and when they live, they live dependent on other people to even take them to the bathroom. May Allah help us and, and protect us from all of this. So, but you need to realize that don't be arrogant before Allah. And the way to show otherwise is to pray to him, is to humble yourself to him and not miss your prayers and ask him. Ask him and you shall be answered. You're not going to lose anything when you ask him because all you can have is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will keep it for you until the day of judgment. And that's even better for you because you will say, oh, alhamdulillah, Allah did not answer this in the dunya and I have it in the akhirah, which means it's more and it saves me. I hope that I uh, gave this topic its due. Uh, right, but I don't think I did. Um, I was basically begging you to please do what the hadith is asking you to do. Shazakum Allah khair. Barakallahu feekum.